situation of Leviticus. I was not planning to do a long series on Leviticus. I thought maybe one or two messages, just give an overview. But I actually enjoy it very much more and more because it's, it speaks to me. It speaks to me and it re, uh, reawakens something that maybe I've lost some concept, uh, some truth, and things that are important for each one of us that we have lost. Because I have said many, many times, and I will keep repeating it, this book is the foundation, uh, doctrinal foundation of our salvation that we find in the New Testament. We find it there. And there is no contradiction from the message of the Old Testament in comparison to the New Testament. The only difference is that Jesus has come to fulfill is the reality. This was a shadow. But the principle laid in this book are so, so important. So let's do some review. The first message was about this next slide. Andreas, thank you. Um, Exodus of Israel, they came to the Mount Sinai, they received the law, they broke the law with the, the golden calf, and then the book finished Last chapter, they finished to set the tabernacle. The glory of God fills the temple, but they cannot enter because the glory of God is there. So this book is about God's holiness, what holiness is about. And then we find here Israel that is uh, unjust, is unholy. How can they be uh, able to connect, to come near a holy God? And we find that the book of Leviticus is the one that will indicate us the way, the method, the requirements, what they need to do, and what God has provided. God graciously provides a way for people to come into His presence. We saw it quite in detail in the first uh, lesson, the first few chapters. The second one, what we saw last time, next slide, is... Uh, the, 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 the ritual that we find in the first seven uh, chapters, the five types of offerings. And we find in this that God does not condemn us. He wants to forgive us. He has made a provision, ways that we can deal with that sinfulness so that we can come to Him. And we have seen the, uh, the types of sacrifices that we have. Uh, actually, they are in, in two categories. One say, thank you, Lord, but the other one deals with our sin. I'm sorry, Lord. Burnt offering, grain offering, fellowship offering. We saw the last time were uh, voluntary sacrifice. The burnt offering, even though it deals with sin, is associated with grain offering and fellowship offering. We saw that many times they come in sequence. They come together in successions. Burnt offering indicate, I want God. But I feel that I'm not deserving. I'm, I'm sinful. God is holy. I want God. I come to you. And Lord, I offer this sacrifice for the forgiveness of my sin. Atonement, blood, uh, fulfilling the requirements, what kind of animals, and all of these things. So that forgiveness uh, takes place. Now, I offer to God my life. I offer my devotion. I surrender a living sacrifice. And I have fellowship with God. I want to have this fellowship with God. So today we are going to um, pay more attention to the other one. It's called the sin offering. This one is not optional. This one is mandatory because all have sin. That's very clear. It's very simple because we all have sin. So this one is not uh, something that we offer to God because we are thankful. It's something that is necessary for us in order to obtain uh, the right and to be accepted in God's presence. And we have this scripture here. We start in chapter 4. We'll do chapter 4, chapter 6, some part of it. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. This is how you are to deal with those who sin unintentionally by doing anything that violates one of the Lord's command. Here we have a, a kind of a strange sounding expression, sinning unintentionally. But we will dig into it and we will uh, understand more what it means. What is unin unintentional sin in Leviticus? The King James says, if a soul shall sin through ignorance. That's how the King James says this. But the word uh, in Hebrew means mistake 
unplanned transgressions, carelessness, error, ignorance, not being aware of, unwittingly, sin that comes often with uh, apology. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't know uh, what I was doing, I was not in my best uh, uh, state of mind, uh, I didn't mean to, to hurt you, so these kind of things. Going astray, sinning, uh, and ignorance. That's basically what sinning unintentionally means. But we will see example. Not only God gives us some rules about it, but he will give us example. You see, we have been, many of us have been Christian a long time. We've been reading the Bible. We think we know, when we hear the word sin, we know everything about sin. But actually, I think we have lost a lot of the deeper meaning of what sin is. We have learned in the first two lessons the, what it means to God, like because of all the r rules and regulations, the blood that was necessary without shedding of blood, the life given over uh, to, to redeem. So, so we know, we have understood something more. To God, how awful that sin makes a bloody mess of everything it comes in contact with. We have seen it in the previous, but now today we're going to see example and associate. Now it's more about ourselves, examining ourselves and seeing what kind of sin do we practice. Do we really care? Do we really know when we sin? Do we really pay attention? Uh, do we, uh, are we sensitive to that? Uh, are we trying to ignore it, justify it? Uh, you know, this kind of thing. So we, we're going to talk about about these things today. It's very important because sin is important in the Bible. Jesus died to take away our sin. So here we will go to the next, the next slide then we will see uh, in the next uh, uh, few verses a list of categories of people and the requirement for their sin. And we will see first verse high priest. And the high priest, when the high priest sin is of course, is the high priest, is the spiritual leader, is the model, is the representative of God. So it, it's it's more serious in and, and that sense because he should guide us and not be the one that sin. Of course, they are men, so they sin as well. But when the priest sin, most likely it will bring guilt upon the entire community also. So he must give a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He must present a young bull, and then the list goes on. It's a lot of scriptures that describe all the requirements, what they need to do. It's very special for the sin of the, of the high priest. Actually, the sin of the high priest is one of the only uh, sacrifice where the, the blood is brought inside the holy. It's, it's spread in the, in the holy place. And uh, the, the, the dead skin and the leftover of the animals on burn is being burnt outside the camp. So that's, very, that's a special uh, offering in a special way because he is the high priest. He is the anointed of God. Then we go to the second verse. We find a sacrifice for the, when the entire community sins. But the people don't realize it. They, uh, they, have, they have not had the clue that they had, they had sinned. Uh, they are still guilty and this expression will be repeated many times you are not aware that you have broken the law but you are still guilty I was sharing this uh, uh, story um, I forgot to pay my income tax on time and uh, when I realized it I really panicked then I really quickly made the check for my first installment, the second installment, tried to redeem myself, and, I, and then I received a letter from the government that I had to pay a penalty, many hundreds of dollars of penalty. Oh no, I don't want to pay a penalty. So I quickly got into the email, I drafted a very nice letter of apologies, I'm bold myself, I acknowledge I paid all, not only the first installment, please waive it for me, I will never do it again. So finally they decided to waive it. <laughs> but the, the point is that uh, uh, if, if you don't know a rule, you don't pay your tax. The government says, okay, you're still guilty. 
That's your job to know the rule. Okay, you understand that? So that's, that's what God is saying here. The communities don't uh, not realize that they are sinning, but they have done something, that they have broken the command of the Lord, but they don't know it. It's, you're guilty, you have done it. Anyway, when I crossed the red light the other day in Shangshai, I was going to the market with my music, and <laughs> I'm walking, I cross the red light, and then there's a policeman, he's running behind me, he's trying to, <laughs> to call me, but I'm not hearing him. Then finally he touched my shoulder. I turned, oh no, a policeman. I, what's going to happen to me? And then he says, uh, you have crossed the street on the red light. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Don't do it again. Uh, phew. Yeah. So, so I don't know if it, it, this would enter into the category of uh, uh, unintentionally. But anyway, it's the second time I've been warned for that uh, recently. Yes. Praise the Lord. Anyway, that's not the point. Okay. It's, the point is that they are still guilty. That's the point. When they become aware of their sin, because they didn't know it, but eventually they will, f they will find out, they must bring a young bull, a different one. The next verse. If one of Israel's leaders sin, doesn't realize it, he's still guilty. You see, no escape. It doesn't matter what level of society, rich, poor, a leader, a politician, uh, the mayor of town, the vice president or whatever. If you sin, you're guilty. Whether you know it or not, you break the rule of God, you are guilty. When he becomes aware of his sin, he has to bring his animal always with, with the, the rest of the requirement. And then for you and me, if any of the common people sin, we don't realize it for different reasons. Maybe we lack instructions. We are new believers. Uh, we never realized that this was sinful because nobody told us or whatever it is. When they become aware of their sin, they bring a female goat with no defect. It starts with the anointed priest, the whole congregation, the leaders, and individual. And the animal's requirements are different for each uh, rank. You know what we learn in this? is that God does not make any exception of people in society. Rich, poor, young, old, whatever countries, language, when you sin, he is guilty, even if you are not aware of that. Because when you broke, break the rule, you have broken the rule. Amen? And sin must be dealt with God's way. That's why God gives us these, uh, all of these. They did not intend to sin, but they did nevertheless broke the law of God. So God sees that and it doesn't make exception of people. Now let's go to the next uh, chapter, the next section. The next section will give us more examples of unintentional sin. This is not a complete list, only some example of what sin is, what type of sin, and how to handle uh, sin according to God's requirement. The first one is you are witnessing, let's see, a, a murder or a, a something, uh, uh, something that happened in the community and then there's a court case and your neighbor is being accused of something. Maybe he's innocent and you have a proof of that. Or he is guilty and you have a proof of that. So if you refuse to testify, this is a sin. Okay, so that's, that's what God says us. So if you know what's right or wrong in a case that, that relates to people, yeah, you need to see it. Suppose you unknowingly touch something that is ceremonially unclean, such as a dead animal. When you realize what you have done, then you must deal with that. You must admit your defilement, your guilt. The verse 3 says, if you, if you touch someone who has touched someone that is defiled, you are also impure. That deals with the principle of death, of being impure in comparison to, to God. So that's what God is telling us. Or suppose you make a foolish vow of any kind. Any of you have made a foolish vow before? Lord, if I win the lottery, I will give 90% to the mission. And, and of course, yeah, no. 
oh Lord I will do this for you or uh, whatever it is and then you just turn around and you, ju you just leave it's just like a foolish kind of any kind it says f whether the purpose is good or, or not or bad it doesn't matter when you realize that was foolish you should not even have, have been this way when you realize your foolishness you must admit your guilt and then when you became aware of your guilt of any of these ways, you must confess your sin. That's really eye-opening, isn't it? You don't realize it, you speak foolishly, you do something foolishly, or you do something wrong, you're not completely aware of what it is wrong. When you find out it's wrong, it's wrong. You're guilty, deal with it. That's what God is saying. Here we have something we hear, something we touch, something we see. And the category of touching a dead uh, animal or something, I would say that for us today we could include whoever we choose to hang out with. The, the relationship, whoever touch our lives, whoever we touch as, a, as our life. We, we make decision that we will go along with these kind of friends. Are they bringing life to you? Or are they bringing a principle of death to you? Their influence, is it helping you to grow in the Lord and become more holy? Or are they uh, giving you an example of that is more worldly and it's okay, you know? So you need to decide what, what will lead you into cleanliness or uncleanness and make some choices. And sometimes you don't realize. But if you follow your friends that are worldly, and they pollute you or they cause you to make some uh, decision, you, you, you drink, you lose your mind because w when there is alcohol there's always a falling away of barriers that we had set, moral barriers. We do foolish things. That's when uh, men beat their wives or their children, uh, guys uh, fight in a bar and uh, kill another one and end up uh, for a life, life prison uh, court case. Uh, you, you, all sorts of things happen when people lose their their minds, their, their moral standards, because their, their faculties have been uh, distorted by substance of, of any kind, or by bad influence. The Bible says, bad company corrupts good, good people. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's and the category of that. Whatever you touch, people who touch you, whatever you hear, and whatever you see, God cares about every aspect and th these things deals with relationship this is about people whatever you see about them whatever you touch or they touch you or whatever you you you, you do or whatever you you see or whatever so it's important and that's category of uh, verses in chapter 5 you have four verses that gives example and 15 verses that shows us how to deal with it. So which one is the most important? Four verses that we know about or 15 verses that tell us deal with it. This is how you have to deal with it. It emphasizes that you and I, we need to deal with our guilt or sinfulness. God is interested. That's what we learn in Leviticus. God is much more interested. Leviticus, we think it's a book of rules, don't do, it's like a, not, not a, uh, a positive book, but actually it is very positive. Why are these rules? It is to elevate you. It is to bring you into purity. It is to make you become a friend with God. It is to help you deal with the problems of every human being. The, the contagion, that sin, the infections of sinfulness. Deal with it and enjoy God. Enjoy a better life. So that's a very, very positive uh, thing here. Does it surprise you that God pays so much attention and has so many requirements for unintentional sins. You know, but the fact is that God is very interesting in removing our guilt so that we can enjoy the full life that He has for us. God has a categories of offerings for the, I didn't mean to. I didn't want to. I didn't think about it. I didn't know. God has a list of requirements for all of these things that we use so many times for ex excuses. How often do we use excuses to justify our wrongdoing? 
but in the eyes of God, they still defile us and they need purification. If it defiles us, it needs purification. It needs blood. It needs substitute. It needs penal penalty and ransom for sin, for any sins, whether we are aware or not. And we use excuses. How often time in relationship with people that we love and people we know, we use uh, uh, excuses for what we have done to one another. Oh, I didn't mean it. No, I'm sorry I said that, but I, I should not have said that, but yeah, I didn't mean it. I didn't know, I, I didn't want to offend you, but actually we have, we have done it. We use excuses like that. I didn't mean to. But God has a, all, a long list of requirements and, and how to do to deal with the I don't mean to type of sin. Think about in marriage, for instance, how often of those, but I didn't mean to, dear, become serious and bring about serious breakdowns that need desperately to be healed. You think about it? How many divorce, how many hurt, how many affairs, how many, uh, you know, uh, ab ab abusive language or angry shouts or, you know, things like this is taking place and then we use the same excuse. I didn't mean to, you see. Think about children. How often they unintentionally break something, forget to do something. And if you are a responsible parent, you will try to correct these unintentionally uh, habits that they are developing because you know that if they are not corrected, it will grow f worse. They will develop the habit of doing these things, of not listening, of not obeying, and then it will grow worse and, and as they move into society. So responsible parents know that these unintentional, little childish, wrong behaviors need to be dealt with. How much more our perfect, holy God, Father, perfect Father will deal with our little wrongdoings that needs to be dealt with, otherwise they will become more and more. The greatest and more serious problem of all of this is that sin causes guilt. Have you ever experienced the feeling of guilt? Yes? Yes. I say, so just a few of you, yeah. <laughs> well, you are blessed if you have not. That guilt blocks a love relationship with God. You know, if you feel, if you find yourself under the dark cloud of negative thoughts, of fear, of feeling unworthy and all these, when you wake up in the morning, you don't roll out of your bed on your knees, oh God, I love you, I'm so happy to see you. No, it, it robs you off of that because you, you don't feel okay, you don't feel in, in, the, in the, the, the right state. Think about what guilt makes in a relationship, how devastating. Guilt leads to anger. Guilt leads to a low self-worth, I'm not worthy, I'm depressed, it will not work. But the, one of the most serious things, guilt leads to use lies to minimize, to compensate, to make us appear uh, a bit better. Guilt makes us unable to open to other friends, so we keep always to ourselves truthfully. All sin defiles us and all sin needs cleansing. But I tried very hard. Well, sorry, blood will be needed to be shed for that. Oh, I tried very hard, but I missed. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to, but I missed. Blood, sacrifice, and all of these requirements will be needed. When you recognize that you have sin, don't ignore it, because the longer you wait, the worse it, it gets, as we will see. God's goal, that's what we need to remember, and that's why this book is so important. It goes back to that principle. God's goal for the life of the Christian is for us to enjoy life with Him. You get it? That's, that's, that's His goal. That means sticking close to Him, pray, 
and dealing with guilt. Now let's move on to the other uh, offering for sin. It's called the guilt offering or the trespass offering in uh, chapter 5, verse 15, 16. If one of you commit I put trespass there because many Bible versions use this word. We will explain it in a moment. Commit a trespass or a sin. Again, we are in the category of unintentional sin, but with a difference. Sin by unintentionally defiling the Lord's sacred property, you must bring a guilt offering to the Lord. It must be your own ram. Or you may buy one, if you don't have a ram, you buy it for the value of, of the ram, equal value, as measured according to the standards found at the temple, the standard of the priest of the time. 16, you must make restitution by paying for the loss, plus, wow, that's good here, huh? plus an additional 20%. Give the payment to the priest, making you right with the Lord, and you will be forgiven. You know, like you, you read, I don't know if you are with me, I read the book of Leviticus many times, but when I read this text right recently, I, I discovered something, it refreshed me. I forgot about the restitution, the 20%, because many times when we deal with sins, oh Lord, forgive me, bye, go. But there is a bit something a bit more serious to that over here. Now, the key word for this one is the Lord's sacred property or God's holy things. And we will talk about it for a moment. A sin committed unintentionally, but against the sacred property, the tabernacle, something that relates to the priesthood or to the, our relationship with God. I will read other Bible version to help us to understand a little bit, uh, in other words, what the same thing is being expressed. When a person commits a truly treacherous act and sins inadvertently concerning the sacred things of the Lord, okay, he commits a truly treacherous act and sins inadvertently according to the things of the Lord. Another one, by failing to hand over the payments that are sacred to the Lord. That's another one. You might sin against me without meaning, without meaning to, by not giving what you promised. It's a different Bible version saying something that relates to this expression here. The difference of this offering here compared to the one before is that mainly restitution has to be made for the sin committed. So keep that in mind. Uh, restitution will be very important. There are two types of trespasses listed in these verses. The first one is trespasses against God, the secret property, the things that belong to the holy things of God, and trespass against man, against your neighbor, your partner, or something. We will talk about that. So defiling the Lord's sacred property is the word mahal. means to cover up, cover, act covertly, tree tree, falsehood, serious transgression, and trespass Accord, and, and regards to the things of the Lord, the duties, like things that we should know about God and taking seriously our relationship or going to church or paying our tithes or doing these different things. And we will talk. Trespass against God seems to be withholding from the Lord that which rightly belonged to Him. Things, either a, a duty an honor, a ceremony, or a payment, or something. Example, the firstborn of the family, firstborn son, needs to be brought to the temple and be consecrated to the Lord. Okay, you neglect to do it. You think it's not important. You don't do it. Because when you go there, you also offer maybe a peace offering. Okay, because it's part of all the series of sacrifice, fellowship, offering. So you don't honor the Lord. The, the, the grain offering is an is a, is a offering of thanksgiving. You don't offer your grain offering. You don't say thank you, Lord. You don't honor the Lord. So this is something that pertains to the ho holy things of the Lord. You, you just like 
It's not really important, it's not meaningful. I live far from town, the temple is far. I am not rich, I don't have a ram in my thing, I don't have lambs. Uh, it's too troublesome, I'm busy, I have continued to, to sow my land and uh, harvest and I have two other things to do. That is that category of things, okay? It's more serious, that's why I say I, I discovered something in the book of, of Leviticus principles that refresh and re-elevate the meaning of certain things that are important to God. If these things are important to God in terms of me considering Him, how I approach Him, how I should be respectful of the things of God, if it's important to God, it should be important to me. Do you agree with that? Yes. We neglect not only to... Um, consecrate the firstborn but to redeem because there's a price for redeem the redemption the weight the withholding of the first fruit you have a harvest you are requested go to the temple bring your first fruit you don't do it for whatever motives that you don't do it um, the tithes bring the tithes to the house of the Lord so that there will be uh, your food food and for, for the for the priest every time Israel went away from the Lord and to uh, idolatry and away from the Lord the temple was always in a time it was been neglected sometimes the door was closed nobody were bringing the the priests had left their duties and then they went back to sow the land and to uh, working on their own and another example making an secular gain of divine things and we see that in tv evangelists all the time okay and many other examples i'm, not, I'm just thinking of that one oh if you give me one thousand dollar write your check more if you give me five thousand you will have more 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 blessing than one thousand you know like using my role as a representative of god to earn more money to to, to manipulate people like spiritual abuse of different kind that is in that category. You, you use the respect that common people have of God, but you use it to manipulate, to gain out of it uh, unholy uh, ways. That is a, a sin. Keeping back any part of the price of things dedicated to God. You know, when uh, Jesus talks in Mark, he, he, he talks to the Pharisees, they have done something very treacherous. They are using the law to break the law to their own advantage. So just, you call it Corban, you're supposed to help your parents with a certain sum of money. This is the law, so it belongs to God. It's part of God's holy things. It's part of the Ten Commandments. But you are not doing it, you are keeping the money of, because it will give you a big, best reputation because you give to the, to the temple instead says, hypocrites, what are you trying to do now? You, you, you're twisting things around. Think of uh, Achan. Achan is another category, but extreme, but he has stolen things dedicated to the Lord, and he has been punished very seriously. Another thing is withholding what men had vowed to pay. Oh Lord, I will give you this. Oh Lord, I, do you think of something, somebody in the New Testament, a couple that have done that? withholding something that they had promised to give. We see that all the time in the Bible. Abraham lied, Isaac lied, Jacob lied, David lied, King Saul lied. Everybody lies. You lie, I lie. Okay, We're a bunch of liars. It's true actually, I'm not joking about it. The only difference is that we, we believe we are not. But God is telling us, maybe you are not aware of. And I will prove it to you in a moment. Just be patient. <laughs> sin arms our relationship with God. The guilt of sin eats us internally. And we need to do something about that. Another thing that is very important in this one is a 20 person high value. You cannot pay 10 person to the Lord. You will have to pay 20 percent instead. Actually, it's true. I'm not making it up. Not giving what belongs to God at the right time is committing a sin. There's a 20 percent penalty. I'm not making it up. You read your Bible. It's not me. That's why I'm saying I'm reading this and I'm 
thinking, wow, I forgot about all of these uh, aspects of our, our, our seriousness and, and, and serving the Lord and going to church and paying. You know, sometimes Pastor Jennifer and I, we, when we bug in the week, we, we talk about these things and we are joking. Like, I don't want to rob the Lord with my tithes. I need to pay this weekend or something like that. Sometimes you may say, okay, I need to pay my tithes next month. Oh, I have something more urgent to this. I will not do it next month. Oh, I need to pay twice. Oh, no. No, I will pay only once. I forget the other ones. It's, it's spent already. You know, like, we, we, we have all sorts of uh, thinking about these things. And I'm not I'm not sharing this to condemn you, pay your tithes. That's absolutely not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to revive some concept that God is talking to us about our motives, about our heart. It's, it's not me like saying, pay your tithes to Lighthouse. That's not what I'm, uh, what I'm after. I'm really discovering some truths about the holiness of God and me and my motives in my own life and making it straight, organize myself more, be serious with the things of the Lord. Another one, say, may you made a commitment to help another Christian, for instance. Oh, I will, uh, I will help that person because they have needs and I will give so much. Then the day comes, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. If I, if I do it, I will not have money to buy my cosmetics or, or to buy my new running shoes. So, uh, you know, I, I, I will just give that one. But the, the, the moment that in your heart, you are a church, you hear the sermon, you, you feel a conviction, and then in your heart, you have not shared with anybody, in your heart, you, you, you say, Lord, I will give something to that person or to some cause or whatever. It becomes a holy, a holy promise. It becomes a holy thing between you and God. You, you've said it, you've vowed. Whether you do it foolishly or not, whether it's for good or bad uh, things, like we have read in the previous things, is the same thing. If we fail to complete that action, this is a sin, pay 20% more. I'm supposed to give uh, uh, Brother Fayez, oh, I want to help his family, I will give 1,000. Here come the month, oh, no, I cannot do it right now. Next month, I should give him 1,200. 20% <laughs> more, because that, that's, that's what the Bible says. Okay. Let's move on. Trespass against, against man. Uh, chapter 6. More uh, example of sinfulness. Suppose one of you sins against your associate and is unfaithful to the Lord. Suppose you cheat in a deal involving a security deposit. You steal and you commit fraud. I hope this is not taking place here. But unfortunately, I know instance in the past where it did happen. People have borrowed money with the intention of defrauding here and the Lord because I'm a Christian and you know me, please help me, I will repay you and psh, to the U.S. <laughs> or you find lost property and lie about it. Or you lie while you're swearing to tell the truth. Or you commit any other sin. You find lost property, this doesn't mean borrowing a pen and forgetting to re give it back. Because I would be guilty many times over. <laughs> or you find a ten, 10 Hong Kong dollars on, on the Nathan uh, Street. That, that's not what we talk, because you don't know what, who this $10 belong to. But he, here it ends to, you find a lost property, but you know, or you have something that tells you, or you have hints, uh, that is the property of something, and it's important to them. So, but I, I like it, I'll keep it, it's useful to me. You, you see, there's, there's, a, there's a difference what we're talking about here. If you have sinned in any of these ways, you are guilty, you must give back whatever you stole, or the money you took by extortion, or the security deposit, or the lost property you found, or anything obtained by swearing falsely. You must make restitution by paying the full price plus an additional 20% to the person you have harmed. On the same day, you must present a guilt offering. The most important is not only the restitution, but don't forget the guilt offering. This is you and God, you, you deal that. Because, and then there's a, there's a requirement here, the, the, the details how this guilt offering should be prepared, which kind of animals, you go to the temple, you lay your hands on, and all of these other things continue. It needs to be done. You, so that your sin will be atoned for, so that you would be forgiven by God. But also you have hurt somebody. It needs to be dealt with as well. You have taken the property, you lied, you swore that it belonged to you and it's not true. At uh, one time it happened to me a few years ago. 
I was responsible to carry an amount of money for someone in an envelope. I got there, it's an admission, I gave the envelope. Then after that, I was told by the person, oh, I did not receive it. Uh, oh, wow, what happened? And then the, the person swore on the head of God that they had not received it, but I, I gave it. But, I, you know, like, what do you do? I came back to Hong Kong, I took my own money, and I gave it again. The first time was from the church, the second time was from my own money. I didn't want to, to mess up with, with this situation, wanted to be right before God. If, if I made a mistake, I don't know, but I was sure I did not. But anyway, that's, that's what I decided to do. Here, I think in the, if, you, if you translate with the text, it's sin by covering up a tree tree. You're defrauding someone. You're taking advantage of someone else. Uh, you know, in God's people, this is all about God's people. So you have something. What happens when someone sins, uh, usually? When someone sins, the, the first thing, if you think about holiness, let me give you this definition and you will see clearly. Holiness is light, pure, truthfulness, Absence of falsehood or deceit or darkness. Is that true? Is that okay? Yes? yes? yes. Okay. Sin is dark, it's impure, it's deceitful, it's falsehood. Okay? I agree? Yes. Okay. Adam and Eve lied, King Saul lied. To Samuel, David lied, Ananias and Sapphira lied, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all lied. Everybody lied for something, serious or not. Lied for murder, or lied about his wife, lied about anything. We lie, okay. Now I have a slide here I want to show you. This is scientific um, statistics about proving that you're all liars, including me as well, okay. We are all big liars. Wait, wait a minute. When do we lie? What do we try to attend? Don't, don't read right now. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, hide, hide this, hide this, hide this. They all reading. They want to know. Am I, am I included in that? Yeah, I, I got you now. I got you. You want to know if you are a liar? Wait. We will tell you later. Okay. Lie is an attempt to bridge a gap or to reach what we wish we were. I don't feel up to that. I'm comparing with others. I want to be accepted in the community. I want to look good among these people and be, you know. So it is bridging a gap for what I wish I was or what we wish we would have or an attempt to connect with other people and be accepted. Lie is the means to hide our guilt, uh, lessen it, justify it, deny it, ignore it, but it does not remove it. It's just like try to pretend that we are not like that. I, like, I want you to think that I am a much more better person than really I am. And sometimes it's in minor things, sometimes it may be in more serious things. So now let's go to the slide. Now you can, you can read about that, the result of that studies and we will close with that. Study shows that you may be lied to 10 to 200 times a day by anybody. Strangers lie three times within the first 10 minutes of meeting each other. You're introducing yourself, what do you do in life, uh, who are you, whatever. We lie more to strangers than to co-workers. Extrovert lies more than introvert, of course they talk more. <laughs> Men lies eight times more about themselves than about other people. Like, you, like I lie more about me than I would lie about uh, Brother Stephen. Women lie more to protect other people. Average married couples, well, don't fight over it this afternoon. <laughs> Ma average married couple lie to their spouse, one in 10 interactions. That's, wow, amazing. By age four, 
90% of children have grasped the concept of lying and know how to use lie to their advantage and it will get worse and growing. According to a study, 2002, University of Massachusetts, 60% of adults cannot have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. 60% of adults. But you will say, but me, I am in the 40%. This is what the study says. It says, and I know you're sitting there right now insisting that you would be part of the 40 person that didn't lie. That's what the liars in this study thought too. When they watched the tape conversation back, they were shocked of how many lies they had told. In general, we lie about things that aren't important. Little things that we think will make us look better or more like likable or accepted, sometimes we do lie about things that matter. 40% of people lie on their resume to get a job. I've done it before. I can drive a big truck, I can be a construction worker, I can do anything, I've done it before. According to a study by Scientific American, a whooping 90% of people looking for a date online, sisters, don't do that. 90% of people looking for a date online lie in their profile. How they introduce themselves. On average, ladies claim to weigh eight and a half pounds less than actually they do. And men pretend that they are taller, richer, or better educated than they actually are. <coughs> Amen, as a conclusion. Do we sin unintentionally? Should we deal with some issues in our life? Should we pay more attention and be more sensitive? And how serious and we consider the holiness of God, the standards of God, and approach God and all of this. God knows we are imperfect beings. God is, but, okay, you're, you're imperfect, I am perfect, but God is not going to lower His holy standards just to make you feel good. Makes sense. So instead, God wants you to be aware of your imperfection. That's why he's quoting all of these things, giving us examples, he's giving us situations, so that, it's, oh, I've done that before. Oh, I've done that before. Oh, somebody did it to me before. So that we gain an awareness of guilt. So that we can let them work in us and transform us to make us holy so that we can live with him. That's the goal of God into this. God does not choose to eliminate from our nature the experience of guilt because experiencing guilt is not all negative. Experiencing guilt does things positive. Like it make, when you feel bad about yourself because of guilt and you're dealing with your sinful situation and relationship with God, it may stir compassion and you hide for somebody else. And it takes your focus out of yourself to focus on somebody else. Number two, it, may con it convicts you. Guilt also has the positive side that it convicts you of your wrongdoing. And three, it forces you to actions. It compels you to turn away from these things because it reveals it to you. You don't feel good about it. You want to solve it. So the feeling of guilt is not all negative. When we ignore our guilt or try to bury it, we lie to ourselves, not only to God. And it is says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we claim to be without sin or guilty before God, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So the scriptures agree with, with that. So how should we deal with guilt? If you look to the next, uh, last, last uh, scripture, when you realize its foolishness, you must admit your guilt. Number one, admit your guilt is to agree with God that our behavior is wrong. We must agree with God first because before we're unaware, we don't know it, it's unintentional, it's ignorant, it, we, we, we didn't get it. So admitting guilt is to agree with God that our behavior was wrong. We acknowledge it. It's the opposite of lying, of hiding it, putting it under the carpet. Number two, when you become aware of your guilt in any of these ways, you must confess your sin. Why confessing? You know, many times we, we, we read in 1 John, we quote that so lightly. 
But now we have a little bit more background understanding. Why should you confess your sin to be cleansed from your iniquities? Jesus is faithful to forgive you and also to cleanse you from iniquities. We are going back to Leviticus. We are going back to the foundations, what God is telling us, this is sin, you need to deal with that. Confess your sins, not only blah, 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 bang, boom, we go. Oh Lord, sorry, bye. Okay, it's more, it's more than that. We confess sin, for what purpose? Because it indicates our desire to turn away from our sins. And also more important, it is an act of humility. We bow our knee, we bow our head, we confess our sin, we acknowledge that we deserve a punishment, but we are asking for help. We're asking for forgiveness from the Lord alone who will forgive us. It's an act asking for divine help and divine forgiveness. Number three, if needed, restitution must be made. Rest, if it is restitution, if you stole money to God, then pay it back. If you stole money to someone or lied or did not act, uh, if you act treacherously, then you need to deal with that with the restitution. If you have hurt people, then deal with that. God, as we said before, is interested in removing our guilt so that we can have a peaceful relationship. Another thing to do about guilt, because you must be careful, there is the memory. Memory is part of our brain, of our system, inner system. Memory of a sin that God has forgiven in the past that we have dealt with is not sin. It's a memory. Keep it, keep it. In, because sometimes a memory of something, a wrongdoing you have done that you have been ashamed of in the past may bring back to you the feeling of guilt. You must reject that because it's a memory. This sin has been dealt. You, you have asked for forgiveness, you have received forgiveness, and you have moved on with your life. But a few months later, a year later, ten years later, that memory suddenly come back. Don't fall into this dark mood under the condemnation of the enemy about that. Just develop always thankfulness. And positive about what God has done. Faith and positiveness. Rejoice in God's grace and in His forgiveness. If these thoughts of guilt return, take time to thank God for His forgiveness. Reminder, remind yourself of the time when you repent. Remind yourself the time when you felt that God has forgiven you, when you dealt with that sin, and don't let it bother you. Guilt infects our hearts. It robs us from joy and peace. But... The good news is that there is a ransom that has been paid, a sacrifice. Jesus is our high priest. He paid. Jesus is our sacrifice. He paid. Jesus is our substitution. Jesus is our mediator. He has done everything. It's done. It's done. It's a done. It's done deal. The good news is that this type of sin that we're talking about this morning are forgivable. And the last verse here and you will be forgiven. That's what God wants you to retain this morning. Amen? Amen. Deal with it and know that God wants to forgive and ye, you are forgiven. Let that stand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, this morning. For